Hey guys, welcome back to the Compass Games Learn to Play series. Today we welcome back designer Greg Smith, who is going to teach us how to play his latest game, Western Front Ace. So let's take to the skies. Over to you, Greg. All right, hi, I'm uh, Greg Graham Smith, and I want to go through a how to play video on Western Front Ace. And so we'll just start from scratch. There's a set of cards in the game that look just like this little card down here at the bottom left of your screen. And these are the sequence of play cards. And they're optional, but I strongly recommended if you never played the game before. So let's just go through that. So first thing is we roll for base aircraft or choose. Well, I'm going to choose uh, Newport 17 because we have a not quite completed version of Vassal here for this game. So that's the one I'm choosing. You'll notice it actually requires one prestige point, and I'll get to that in a minute. But normally I wouldn't be able to choose that. But it says prepare your log sheet. All right, let's just assume I've done that. Oh, yeah, choose your base. I'm going to choose Coincy. I think that's how you pronounce that. In France, obviously I'm France. I'm choosing this base. My opposite base is over here. And then I'm going to prepare my aircraft display mat, which I have done already in advance. I have a lot of markers already ready to go. This is the mission, which has been chosen yet. And some ammunition markers, six points of ammo. So I got three markers on the two side. I start the game with a bon chance, which is their good luck charm. And I start the game with a reflexes skill and the advanced maneuver skill. Now you might wonder why are there skills up here on your pilot chart? And why are some of them on the mat? And the answer is the ones that are on the aircraft mat are the once use once permission skills. So once we use reflexes, for example, in a mission, we flip it to the use side, just like that. But the ones over here are basically static skills or they're always in effect. Now the next thing is attend flight school. Basically what this does is at the top, you have three things, gunnery training, flip three cards using the two firepower columns. So let's just do that. We'll flip the first one and it's a four. So I don't need to actually flip any more cards because the two firepower column has a four result and that's good enough. So what that does is I get the training gunnery marker, which I'll place over here on my pilot mat. Gunnery minus one. So basically what that is, it's a coupon. When it comes time to buy the gunnery skill, if I want to buy it, I'll get it for a buck cheaper or a one skill point cheaper. All right, so that's what that's all about. So let's go to flight training, roll 2d6. I rolled a six, not good enough. So I, I'm not going to get the ACM coupon here. Third thing is landing training, roll three times plus two. Basically, if I roll 11 or 12, I don't get the skill. Boom, four, 11, all right, that's it. So I could have gotten the landing skill for free, but instead I'm gonna delete it. So that's the top part of flight training. Bottom part of flight training is spare time activities. Now I'm gonna choose extra carousing because that gives me, as we see over here, a prestige level of one. I get one experience point for having graduated from flight school. So it's right there. But what the prestige level of one and one prestige point does for me is it allows me to get the Newport 17. So that's that explains this prestige required one. I, I've got it. So I'm starting the game with one. There it is. All right. Congratulations. We have graduated from flight school. So let's move on. Now. First thing we do is at the first of every month, which is what this is, you place and remove major ground defensive markers, MGOs. You see, we got the SOM over here on the map, placed it on the SOM, and the other one here is Verdun. Now, if you flip them, you can see that Verdun is active from September to December of 1916. Well, the game starts in September. I think it was actually started before then, historically. But the, in game terms, that's it's active for all those months. So we place and or remove these as required. Now, what they do for you is, if I was, for example, stationed here at Remick Court, Verdun would be active for me because that's my part of the trench line. But I'm at Quincy, so 
neither of these offenses will impact my play, just the way it is. If I was over in Remy Court and I rolled a seven, instead of the uh, mission on the chart, I would actually get a ground attack mission in support of Verdun. And you get to gain extra points. Not necessarily a bad thing. Pretty good thing as far as uh, getting points. It's a bad thing because it's a little more dangerous doing ground attacks and balloon attacks, as you'll find out. All right, but we're here. So we've placed our markers. And then we roll 1d6 for the number of contact patrols. I rolled a four. So that means in September 1916, I've got four patrols. So I write a four on my log sheet. Basically, you're flying every day in reality. But contact patrols is a concept of these are the four times during the month that you actually have a good chance or you did encounter somebody or someone or have some action. A lot of times you're just flying around, nothing happens. So we don't screw with that. Even though you actually fly every day, we don't, we're only counting four of those missions because these are the ones where something happened or had a good chance of happening anyway. All right. So we've got four contact patrols. We now move to chart A1 and we roll for our mission. We're not central powers, we're French, so we're down here for allied. So they use the 1916 allied, and I roll a nine. All right, so that is a line patrol. All right. To succeed on a line patrol, I've got to at least make it up to no man's land. So that's a line patrol. For, in order for success, I got to at least fly to there. And then I can come home. All right, fair enough. That's our mission. What do we do next? We now take off and move to the takeoff box. So our endurance goes to the takeoff box here. And our aircraft goes out of the hangar to the takeoff, green takeoff box. Now, in this game, right after taking off, uh, you're assumed to gain altitude. But you can actually have an encounter. So you roll right away on the first chart for that. So the A3, the encounter chart. And we see that, again, uh, one thing to explain, the Germans actually stayed on their side of the lines more often than the Allies. But the Allies came over more to their friendly line, to the what would be the German friendly lines. So this is for the, uh, the Germans, when it says enemy lines or friendly lines, this is what they use, uh, such power. The Allies, when it, they get a friendly lines, they use this one. So we're going to roll. We roll an eight, nothing. Let's move our encounter. Our endurance goes down a box because we move a box further in friendly territory. Back to the chart. We roll a pen, which is nothing. Okay, so then we burn another endurance, and we are now in no man's land. So, by the way, the use of the map is actually kind of optional, but we can do that to make them equate. All right, so we're at no man's land. Let's roll for our encounter. And, okay, I rolled an 11, which is a two-seater. And we single asterisk only applies to if you're flying uh, solitary hunting, which we are not doing yet. So we have a two seater. So let's roll on the two seater chart. German two seaters. So we're going to roll for that. And we rolled a five, a Rumpler C4. So we have a Rumpler C4. That's our encounter. So let's come down here to the two seater map. Now, don't be confused by these pictures on the B-10 two-seater map. They're just representative of the class. Basically, we have all the two-seaters from both sides are represented here. And for lack of a better term, I'll call them the large, medium-sized, and small ones. And this large one actually represents any of these six aircraft. This medium one represents any of these nine aircraft. And this small one represents any of those seven aircraft. So we see that a Rumpler C4 is actually in the center, center section. So we're going to use this to represent that Rumpler, even though it, the, the picture's of a French. It doesn't matter. So the Rumpler, we look at the Rumpler stats. We see that it's speed 11, agility 1. And you compare that to us. We're speed 11, agility 2. So we have a slight advantage. It also... Does have rear guns, why for yes, but there isn't a plus one, which would mean that it's twin rear guns. They get a bonus, but this one doesn't. So it's just normal rear guns. All right, great. 
So let's move right along. Now that we have our encounter, let's roll for starting orientation on chart B1. Okay, so B1 is either somebody's advantage out of the sun, a head on, whatever. All right. So I'm going to roll a six. We are head on. So conveniently enough, I've, I have a rumpler right here. And here's my aircraft. So this is the orientation. This is where combat basically takes place as far as the orientation of the two aircraft during fighting. All right. Now, by rule, he's going to try to get away. So he's going defensive right off the bat. Once he is advantaged, he will try to escape by rolling dice. And if he's tailing me, he automatically disengages. So he's going to try to disengage. Right now, he can't do anything except suck up my bullets. Now, I could use reflexes to fire first, but I think it's more important to save that for orientation change. That's the other use. So I'm just going to shoot. He's going to defend. He His tail gunner doesn't get to fire this round because we're head to head. The observer only fires if he's disadvantaged or tailed. All right, so first combat card, second combat card. I have a three firepower, so I do four hits. That's pretty solid. He side looped. So he actually improves by one. He doesn't have a rotary engine. So he does get to improve by one, but he sucks up all four damage because I did four hits. All right, so that's good. So I'll do this. I'll improve him just so I don't forget about it. He improves by one, so I actually go sideways. All right, so now he takes his four hits. Well, where, how do we do damage? Well, let's go to... Chart B6, the fighter damage chart. So this is where if you roll a red four and a white two, that isn't a six, it's a 42. So the position matters. We did four solid hits, so that's pretty good. So I did a four, <laughs> speaking of 42. Port strut, 25. Starboard strut, two struts. Another port strut, 44. And a canvas. Canvas is basically just goes through the plane without doing damage. So we go back and I have shot him up pretty good. So he took two port strut hits and a starboard strut hit. All right, so that was pretty good. All right, so now comes the end of the round uh, initiative check. So if you're within two of each other, there's no change. You have to have three or better to gain a position. So, and you just roll, but I have a, basically I'm 11 plus two is 13. He's an 11 plus one is 12. So I get a buck. So we'll just, I'll be the first die. Five to one. Well, this actually worked out awesome. So I get six to his one. So that's five difference. So guess what? I gain two positions, which means that, All right, so the first gain is me head up, and the second gain is he is now sideways. Now, I have a decision to make, and I think it's a no-brainer. I'm going to use my reflexes at the very last thing in the round, and I am going to use it to gain another position. So I am on his tail, and now we start the second round of combat. So we'll do, discard these cards. All right, now his rear gunner is going to shoot at me. So first thing we'll do is we'll draw the first and second combat cards. So I have a gun jam. <laughs> All right. So uh, roll for random if more than one firing. But of course, uh, yeah. Oh, I've got the fire my. Uh... So I fired one round, but this time it's uh, we're jammed. That is very unfortunate for me. He did a barrel roll anyway to avoid two hits. Now, if I'd have had weapons maintenance skill, I would have ignored that gun jam and I've done three hits. He still would have ended up taking one. But All right, so my gun's jammed. He did his barrel roll, which turned out to be unneeded. But now he draws a third card for his, his observer. And his observer uses the bottom section. Defense fire, two hits. Oh, goody. So I'm going to take two hits. 
Let's go to the charts. <laughs> 46. Ah, forward weapons just got hit. So they're not only jammed, they've just been damaged. So goody there. Yeah. And a canvas 65. All right. So bottom line to this whole mess is I don't have to worry about unjamming my gun because they are now in op. And I took a canvas hit for my second hit. All right. He took no damage. End of round. I get a plus one. Oh, five to one. So I stay firmly on his tail. I have no offensive capabilities at this point, so I'm just going to let him go. So then uh, I have achieved my mission, by the way. I made it to no man's land. So he flies off. I'm going to go home. So I go there. So I burn another fuel. But I go backwards this time. Oh, yeah, it was up there. Now I roll for an encounter, which is some uh, nothing. And then I go to the takeoff and landing box. But before I land, I actually roll for another encounter. And some again, nothing. All right, so we land. First thing we do is we roll for the weather, 10-sided die. Roll to one. The weather's just fine as it stands. It's good. Really, the landing is only problematic if you have... Landing gear damage and the weather's bad, basically. And maybe some other issues, like you're wounded. There's uh, the uh, landing chart, as you can see. It's a safe landing one through, up to 12, so it's immaterial. In this case, because it's good weather, we have no, our landing gear is fine, so we just automatically land. We don't even need to roll. But it can't get bad. So we have successfully landed. After the mission, it was a successful mission, so we, we do get a, a quarter of an experience point. We can't really upgrade our aircraft, check for awards and promotions. We actually are awarded the, uh, there's a French award called Cited in Orders. So, go to the French awards, and it's this puppy right here. So, we are Cited in Orders. Now, because the Vassal module is incomplete yet, I had to use the American pilot status, but just pretend it's the French pilot status. So I actually won an award here, which also gives me a prestige point. So now I have a prestige level of two. So I got my was cited in orders, gave me my prestige point. Uh, we landed, go back to the hangar. Well, actually this goes there. And uh, our line mission was a success. So basically, I didn't even have to use my advanced maneuvers because I never really was in defensive trouble. But it was disappointing that I got a uh, gun jam, but that's going to, but there's a reason why there's a weapons maintenance skill in the game. Uh, it's pretty good, actually. So that is basically how to run a mission. Other than that, I would just say that uh, it, it plays pretty simply. There are a few nuances to the combat. Okay, it isn't just flip cards. I mean, instead of flipping a card, you can always use a skill. And so that is a, a decision point for you. I would certainly recommend reading about all the different skills. Skills are what keep you alive in the game. And so these advanced maneuvers could be very powerful, as you can see here. By the way, I could, I could also, instead of a card draw, I could, you can always do a standard maneuver. A tight turn, barrel roll, or dive. And you can always do a advanced maneuver instead of a card draw, but you have to have the advanced maneuver skill, possess it, and they have to be bought in order. By the way, this French award cited in orders is only after my first victory. This is assuming I had shot the two-seater down, which I did not do. So actually, I shouldn't have that. Uh, I didn't get cited in orders after all. But had I shot him down, then I, I would have gotten it. All right, that's about it. That's how to run a mission.